So you, you guys could have shared this one. Okay. Um, so obviously, so so far we talked about the point of view of corporate developers. Uh, so the buyers, uh, how do they think about the positions? Uh, we heard from a banker uh, the structure of deals, uh, what you can do to get ready, what bankers are useful for, um, and now we're going to hear from entrepreneurs uh, who went through ten days. Uh, one very recent, three very recent. Ryan with uh, John Bites, and uh, another one a little bit older deal, but pretty famous as well. Um, Charles Wong from uh, so Guitar Heroes, the name of the, the title of the company is Red Octane. Um, and Charles has been uh, very active as a, an entrepreneur after that, using other companies and uh, as an investor as well. So the session is all about uh, their experience going through an MA, uh, what they did before, what's happened, uh, how they organized their team, uh, um, in the case of Charles. Um, Maybe uh, tell uh, Ryan a bit about what's the future of post acquisition, <laughs> what happens. Uh, so, yeah, uh, do you want to add something to this introduction? To start with Charles. Uh, yeah, so as Brent said, my uh, exit was a while back, it was 2006. <laughs> so that was a while back, then it was a uh, sales of the company. So there are certain things that we can talk about later that uh, are uh, kind of the process of going from a, a private startup to overnight being part of a, a public uh, entity. Which is kind of interesting. Um, and uh, other than that, you know, background is in video games. Uh, we built hardware, which is, you know, for Guitar Hero, if you remember the game, there's a lot of hardware controllers. Uh, and so there, there was uh, also a different element in that we were sort of a, a hardware software company being sold to what was uh, entirely a software company that we can touch on as well. Right. Yeah, I can relate to a few of those things. Um, uh, we were founded in 2010. Uh, get the mic. Okay. We, we were uh, founded in 2010. Uh, built a company that initially was focusing on government sales. So we, we, we bid on government contracts um, to sell the bikes and provide technology services. So we were a technology provider and there was independent operators, uh, for profit, non profit government that were our clients. So when you say government, that was like city bikes, city operators, or other types? Yeah, so, so even if the city wasn't the direct client, they would be organizing a public procurement process and, and governing the selection process, and we would partner with another company that would do the operations and we did the technology supply. Uh, so we built that uh, from, you know, we had our, our first paid pilots in 2012. Uh, 2016, we hit 10 million revenue and profitability on that business model. And then the last year and a half, the entire space uh, was catalyzed and kind of went crazy by uh, activity in China. Uh, I don't know how much, how much backstory you want to do on this opening model, but uh, so it went from a slow moving kind of uh, government contracting business, hardware and software, uh, to a very fast moving, well capitalized space uh, in a very short period of time. So starting last spring, uh, we began pivoting toward uh, a different business model. We actually made uh, five. Uh, pretty big moves to set us up, set, us up, uh, set ourselves up for the exit. Um, so I yeah. Interesting. So that so basically you were building kind of a B2B company. Um, you started to evolve to what like some B2C offering, and then the market just totally changed, and that also like pushed you to evolve your company and get ready. Yeah. So last spring, uh, February March, we lost four million in revenue. Uh, the contracted projects that we were on for a couple of years, they were uh, on people's desks for signature, and those contracts disappeared. So it was four million rather than a two-week period. So we realized that the fundamental idea of cities buying bike share systems was was done, and we had to quickly adjust uh, the business accordingly. So the five things that we did: uh, 
One, we had been uh, working on a rebrand of the company for quite a while, uh, we're considering a rebrand. So we, we, uh, the previous brand was Social Bicycles, uh, which was fine for being the contracting, but wasn't a great consumer brand. So we rebranded from Social Bicycles to Jump. Uh, two, we made a move toward vertical integration, toward owning and operating the fleets. Uh, and so that means bidding as the prime bidder uh, and, and, and staffing up a team to do day-to-day operations. Uh, three, we introduced an electric bike product. Uh, we've been working on it since 2015, uh, and we brought it to market last summer. So we've already been product development for two years, uh, and we're able to bring it to market in summer of 2017. Uh, so that's three. Four, we did the uh, strategic distribution partnership with Uber, which is what we'll spend a lot of time talking about today, how a strategic partnership led to the acquisition. Uh, and then lastly, we uh, raised the Series A. Uh, we've been in the space for a long time, and basically SOS was the only uh, company that put significant capital in, the only uh, fund that put significant capital in. There was no venture capital appetite for it. It was really hard uh, to get the business going. Um, but we were finally able to close uh, a round of Menlo Ventures in the fall of last year. So those are the five things that we did to like go and really pivot the company in multiple ways to set ourselves up for success in this new context. So it's kind of interesting that in your case, like all the, the city bikes in China, like the dockless bicycles, like mobile, also, like also uh, went on to, to impact the US market. But in the case of Charles, um, actually some of that, some of your initial ideas around uh, uh, music games also came from Asia, and then you worked on like trying to develop your own for the, the Western markets. Uh, yeah, that's correct. So, so music games uh, first took off in Asia, especially Japan. There were games like Dance Dance Revolution, and other games that you may have seen that were just hugely successful in Japan. Um, and, and we spent years trying to figure out how to make these music games uh, popular in the West. And uh, so there was uh, a lot of time we spent studying those uh, and trying to make changes to the content, to the, to the game design, uh, to fit them more to uh, a US and European market. So let's, uh, let's talk about what, what were the, kind of the first moments where you thought, okay, maybe, maybe we're, we're gearing up for an acquisition. Like what, made, what gave you initially that feeling? Uh, was that not like a market change, or something about your business, but we feeling that you were hitting a plateau? Or? Well, what was it? Um, so there was uh, an interesting period where we, we spent also, like Ryan's you know, business, years in just obscurity. Nobody cared. The first five years of our company, nobody really cared. It took us five years to kind of grow to nine million revenue. Um, and then we released Guitar Hero, and as things tend to happen in video games, uh, it's hit driven. So that game became an instant hit. Uh, the following uh, 12 months after that, we went from 9 to uh, 50 million in revenue. Uh, and, and so that, that was the catalyst. Basically, everybody in the industry started to see the game. And they, they reached out. So we went from a period where before we released the game, we tried to raise $3 million. Uh, we were asking for a, uh, uh, we were trying to raise three on a $15 million valuation. When the year before, we had done a 9 million in revenues and we were already profitable. We couldn't get any investments, and as soon as the game came out, we started getting offers from private equity firms to invest $30 million. And then immediately thereafter came uh, acquisition offers. So um, I think the, the, the catalyst for us was a, was a hit product that then drove both investment interests and acquisition interests that all happened within probably a span of three months. Okay, so in your case, so that all tri triggered by a hit. But it, so uh, Ryan, in your case, you were already in the market for a while, but doing B2B. Uh, actually, Things could have started to look a little bit dangerous because suddenly you had tons of competitors coming to the market. It's so almost the exact same story that he had, which is uh, we uh, we did that summer have a few e-bikes on the street and private data, um, but it didn't really get traction because it was such a small scale and it was it was a closed system. And then that fall, we launched in Washington D.C. Um, and again. There's less than 100 bikes, it was subscale. Uh, you know, it was effectively the same product. I mean, I, even out last spring, I was raising a you know, prototype going from door to door, but no interest. I could not get around funded, but I could show up with this magical bike, and you know, I didn't have the data to support it, um, that, that it was actually something people wanted. Uh, fast forward to January of 2018, uh, we got a permit to launch 250 bikes in San Francisco. Uh, and so we had enough scale, we had the explicit permission from the city, 
And the, the number one learn, learning is you know, VCs don't look very far past their doorstep. <laughs> so you have to your bike in front of them. Yeah, you have to literally make an impact in their day to day field of vision. Uh, <laughs> uh, and we did in a big way. So we launched in January and the ridership just took off instantly. Um, and so this first, you know, first week it was already two or three trips per bike per day, then it was six, then it was 10 trips per bike per day. Uh, and the corresponding revenue numbers too, these were all paid trips. So we have each bike doing $15 a day in revenue. And so we validated the economic model that we've been shopping for the previous six or nine months. Um, and it was generating tons of social media, tons of like, People talking about on the street and just the amount of a ton of buzz in this ecosystem. Um, so in a three-month period from January when we launched, you know, literally early January, <laughs> I said to my wife, "There's a chance this all might not work out. Do you want to move with me to Argentina and just like hide out there for a while and figure out what's next?" Um, that was early January, and then you know, within three months, everything changed. So. Uh, we got both extremely strong, um, we, we had a very, very good offer for a Series B round with very reputable, like, like the best of the best out here for a $50 million large round. Uh, and we just saw the, the numbers coming out of SF, we saw the traction we had, um, and they, they were basically competing with Venture on, um, on making that position. So... The competition was also coming in, right? Did that affect much of the of kind of your your perception of the market? Like, hold on. So I, I've, I've seen uh, I've seen I've seen now all those Chinese bikes. We offer the more bike, the cool bike. Uh, there's also Gobi and a few others. Yeah. Well, in lots and lots of cities around the world. They, what did that look like a threat? Uh, well, it was clear that there has to be a leveling up, or it was like scale up or get out, or, or in this case both, you know, and we're aligned with, with Uber has you know, more capital to put into this than anybody else. So it's clear there's going to be consolidation, there's going to be companies that die, there's going to be, um, <clears throat> you know, there, there's, there's going to be pretty fierce competition, and you want to be aligned with enough capital. So either we were going to, you know, do that large round and then prepare to be on a fundraising treadmill for the next 24 months, or uh, exit in a way that sets, up, sets us up for success for that next 24 month period. Um, and I think the, you know, we had been at it for almost 10 years at that point. Um, some of the investors have been in the company since 2012. Uh, so I think based on our cap table, based on the amount of gas in the tank from the entire team, based on our competitive position in the market, which is becoming increasingly competitive, um, based on alignment with the acquirer. Um, so I felt like we were going into uh, an acquirer that would let us achieve our vision and goals. Um, so for all those reasons, it, it made sense to, to do an acquisition. So I'd like to turn to Charles now, because so in your case, you're setting up your like a fleet of bikes, quite capital intensive. In the case of Charles, you guys were already selling tons of products, and you had profitable unit economics on every single one. So you actually had the option, you didn't need to raise capital, you could just kind of keep growing the company. So what, what decided you to, uh, to basically go another way? Yeah, that's, uh, it's true. We, um, you know, up until that point, we had never raised venture capital. Uh, we tried, we couldn't, you know, nobody would invest in us. So, we, we had to bootstrap our whole, our whole company up that, which changed the dynamics, because even though it was our decision, you always have to, as Ryan was talking you have to take into consideration that your investors, what, what their interests are at that moment, uh, perhaps your employees who have been around a long time. Uh, in our case, uh, we just had a bunch of uh, individuals, uh, angels, who had invested in our company. We were already profitable. Uh, we understood in the video game industry that when you have a hit, you can become very profitable fast. And uh, we just had to figure out, a, you know, we were thinking about paying out dividends to employees, to ourselves, to our investors as a way. And that's something that you can't do, for instance, with, with uh, uh, VC funds. They can't really pay dividends. And so there were options for us to stay, pro uh, to stay private and to continue just operating as an You could have also like, bought out some investors, potentially. Yes, yeah. Uh, by that time, we'd only, we'd only taken in two and a half million. Uh, in initial investment, and that year we were already netting 10, uh, and so, you know, on 15, and, and, and so we, there were many ways that we could have done this. 
Uh, I think our ultimate decision uh, came down to, uh, as, as we started talking through with uh, uh, both the investors, the private equity investors, as well as uh, the acquirers, there were a couple things we realized. Uh, if we were to, to, to go it alone, uh, you know, we thought we had a, a, a reasonable chance at an IPO. Uh, we were working on some things uh, uh, to, to roll up a few companies to get us to about 125 million in, in revenues. And, and if we had taken 30 million investment, we could have done that. Um, but uh, talking about those uh, issues that are uh, sort of, we were considering besides just whether to sell the company at what price, was <clears throat> we, uh, we had a very smart board member who was advising us. We said that, you know, if, you are, uh, if you're, at that time, my, my brother and I, who were the two co-founders, we own over 50% of the company. He said, at that percentage ownership, you go public, it's very hard for you to sell your state because you own so much of it. Uh, when we were looking at an acquisition from a company that was, at that time, had about a $4 billion market cap, he said, you know, inside that company with a $4 billion market cap, there's enough liquidity for you individually and all your employees and all your investors to sell as much or as little stock as they want to. Uh, and uh, so besides the normal business risks, there was also some personal considerations that, that he was advising us on. He said, when he was CEO of a public company, he said he had a million shares, and when he tried to sell 8,000 shares, he'd get calls from analysts asking, why are you selling this? Are you having trouble be, you know, making the quarter? Uh, and, and so there's a lot of issues uh, with sort of personal liquidity as well as, as, as company and investor liquidity that all went into the decision for us. It's quite funny because actually in, in Paris we, uh, we had one um, startup CEO who has a robotic company to public and um, he was saying like just before the session he was checking on his phone the, the effect of, on the stock price of some kind of block shares that were just sold by one investor and I was like, this is, you know, you have to, you, know, you don't really exit when you're IPO, actually. The investors exit, but the founders don't. Um, actually, another thing that's kind of a, I think, quite interesting topic since uh, it was uh, mentioned in the previous sessions is uh, when you acquire it, uh, typically the, the buyers, they want you to stay because you built everything and you have a lot of good skills and they want you to keep building what, you, what you've already been building. So how did that work for you on the new case? I don't know how much you can disclose because it just kind of just happened. But uh, so Charles, tell us about like the what kind of terms went with the, the acquisition offer. Okay, so uh, since I'm completely out of that one, I, I guess I can talk about that freely. Um, we had a, uh, a rather complex in terms of payout. Uh, uh, you know, the, the way that the deal worked was uh, it was split up into five payments. There was an initial payment. Uh, uh, and then there was a, a second payment after two years. Uh, and, and that was guaranteed. So uh, just to put sort of real numbers to it, just get everybody again. The, uh, there was $100 million guarantee of which 60 was paid at, at the close of the deal and the 60 was paid after two, uh, 40 was paid after two years. That portion was guaranteed, both the stock and the cash, to be worth $100 million, regardless of what the acquirer stock price was. Then there were three years of earnouts set uh, 15 million year one, 15 million year two, 20 million year three. And those were all the shares priced at the time of the closing of the deal. So that was the 50 million. They said, you ride with us here. If the stock price goes up, you benefit. You get more than the stock price goes down, you're gonna you take the pain alongside us. But the, the initial the other the other two payments of hundred was guaranteed. He said no matter what happens to our stock, if we go to zero, you're gonna get a hundred million dollars. You and all your you and all your investors. So it was, it was, it was rather complex, uh, sort of, especially for a deal that size. But what that meant was we had three years of earnouts we had to hit. Uh, and um, so that means sales figures. Yes. And you know, targets. Yeah. And knowing that you don't really have full control of marketing budgets or that anything can happen in the meantime, right? Yes. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's a tricky part. Uh, you know, a lot of times public companies like to put, especially if you own a product and you own a PL, they like to put. Uh, a target, both uh, both in terms of revenues and in terms of profits on uh, on the earnings. Um, it, uh, I think, what we were doing it. Most people advised that uh, that uh, in, in these M and A situations, most companies don't end up making their earnings. Uh, we ended up making our earnings. Um, there was uh, the, the sort of the success of the product. We we blew through that pretty quickly, and uh, so by by sort of after year one, we had already. 
basically what happened was we went from 50 million to 300 uh, with the target of two, but 1.1 billion by the target of three. And already in year two with 300 million, we had blown through year three targets. So we knew as long as we sustained it, uh, uh, we were going to be okay. And we just had to make sure at that point that we were kind of making the business run uh, and, and, and not drop off and uh, protecting the year now for all of us in our show. So, so the question for the, from the buyer's point of view was whether they were they had that to like a one hit wonder, whether it could turn into a franchise. Yes, yeah. So that, that in, in the case of Activision, uh, as a video game company, uh, they were uh, looking to all of the deals that they do. A lot of a lot of public companies do this. They, they needed to be accredited to earnings, earnings per share. So we had to contribute to their earnings per share. Uh, and in our case, um, over the next three years, we kicked off I think about 700 million of free cash flow for the company. So, so uh, in that process, uh, that's part of the reason why they put these financial metrics on for us was uh, they're they're in an industry where they don't really get value based on technology or story. You get value a lot on the financials. So the deals are structured in a way that uh, are built around financials, top line, uh, EPS, appreciation. Uh, and so uh, we had to manage that part, uh, as opposed to as a startup, you know, you're trying to build technology, you're trying to build products, uh, and then suddenly the next three years was entirely different. We just focused on financials. So I'd like to turn to, to Ryan. So how much can you share about the terms of the deal? <laughs> uh, it's a little bit. Okay. 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 Um, so <laughs> the the deal was set up in a way where I have I have. A lot of incentive to stay for a couple of years, you know, for indefinitely, really. Um, and some degree of autonomy in terms of how we grow the business. Uh, and so, so I'm reporting directly to the CEO, directly to Dara. So, does that mean that this is a kind of a business entity with a kind of separate PL? Yeah, there's, uh, there's many ways that we're, we're integrating with the mothership, but uh, attracting performance and, and measuring the business, um, we should be able to do that. Uh, it is being tracked as a separate business. Yeah, that's kind of interesting because uh, so recently there was another big, big acquisition in your space in China. Uh, so uh, the Matrian, uh, the team, the food delivery, the life service company. Uh, acquired uh, mobile for was it like two point seven billion dollars? They had raised tons of money, I think over a billion dollars. Yeah. I remember, uh, but that's a huge acquisition, and I'm not so clear whether mobile was profitable or will be, because no. they, you know, the, you see those pictures of like bikes hanging up, yeah. <laughs> giant cars. Um, so it seems that they're just pouring money to just flood the market with bikes and try to kind of own this last few miles. Um, so it's a very it seems like it's a very different type of business because it looks like you have proven something on the economy like with unique economics, but this was still capital intensive business, but you could scale it and replicate it in other cities. Yeah, so the what we're charging you know, we're getting two fifty or so per trip. Um, and so if you're getting the utilization rates, you actually have a business that works. And this is you see all the funding activity happening in scooters right now. Um, and that's what's driving it. You actually have data, real data coming out of the these cities. So like a four or five trips a day is making like 10 or even more like 10 to 20 dollars per day. So, so you, if you get about three, three, three or four trips in the city, you're, you're going to be profitable. So we're, we're doing 10. So it's, uh, it's compelling. Um, so yeah, but for that reason, we're tracking the business, we're tracking the upside. There's some retention baked into that. There's also just some retention baked into, baked into the Kind of earning out and, and, and I guess fully fully investing the the my proceeds from the sale, um, and and then yeah, it's it's more important than the financials. It's is it is it a business that I'm aligned with that uh, I have I have a degree of control in terms of decision making, um, and so it's all those other important things, which is how can I build the business. So that kind of leads me to a question around like the choice of your your buyer. So it looks like in the UK there was consolidation in the market, so maybe there were just a few potential buyers. 
Um, did you try to get competitive bids? Did, did you get investment bankers involved? Like, how did that work? Actually, we didn't end up hiring a banker. We we did spoke to bankers in the prior year, um, and we knew most of the other potential buyers. We you know we would we did put out feelers through different channels. Um, the biggest piece of leverage we had though was our fundraising activity. So you don't you only need really any negotiation you need one other really strong option and we had that. Um so like we, the VC rounds was yeah. It, yeah so, so we did we did explore other MA, but but frankly we were most interested in doing a deal with Uber because we like the ability to take our business global really, really quickly. And so I didn't see any other potential buyer, whether it's an automaker, whether it's direct competition, whether it's a wild card. I didn't see anybody else that was set up to scale our business in the same way. So we wanted to be, if we're doing an MA, that was the, so long as the price was there, that, that was where we wanted to be. Um, and then for me, it was just, do we want to do that or do we want the opportunity to build our own company ourselves and have full control and build it with our own identity? So that was the, the difficult decision. Um, and that also provided a lot of leverage in getting the deal up. That's kind of interesting. So because of what yeah, no, 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 uh, yeah, right. Right. something so, interesting that was part of our work, just very tactically. Um, you know, when 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 uh, the, the private equity firms put term sheets in front of us and also an acquisition team, they wanted no shop clauses, but the no shop clauses were only you know, in our case, the private equity firm didn't want us to talk to other investors, but we could talk to an acquirer and vice versa. So we were actually free to continue those discussions, uh, but we just couldn't talk with somebody in the same category. The acquisition came along and also asked for a no shop clause, but it was also to talk to other acquirers. So oddly, we sort of, yeah, we lucked into that we could continue both conversations without running afoul of the no shop clause. So it sounds like we hear a lot about those kind of exclusive terms and no shop. Uh, obviously, it's very much in the benefit, the benefit of the potential buyer because they don't want you to shop around your deal and get more competition and like, prices to go up. Um, but uh, one, one thing I also uh, kind of heard in a, another conversation is that essentially when you're looking for a buyer, or there's really one company that's really a good fit and really serious, and everyone else is kind of somewhat there and is useful to have them to kind of get a, kind of get a better deal out of it. But uh, did you feel you had, so I think you kind of answered that question, that for you there was only one really good fit. Um, but did you have other offers, or did you consider other, other offers? There was, there was other interest. It was also happening at a very compressed timeline. So when you're getting one person fairly close, when you're getting one company fairly close to the finish line, uh, you got to think about the opportunity cost or risk that that falls apart for somebody else that's fresh in the conversation. So if you want multiple bidders, they should, you should engage them all pretty early and try to bring them in around the same so that, time. that was said in three sessions, like basically you should come kind of like basically get to know them like a year, two years, or even earlier than that. Yeah, or you know, or at least so I actually did fire off it was it was kind of clear in early February that things things were happening. So I did fire off a few emails saying, hey, you know, you we might want to have a conversation. Uh, and you know it was also sort of indicative that Uber was moving extremely quickly. Uh, in the urgency, whereas the other is like, oh yeah, we're interested, or like, you know, they didn't really pursue it that hard. And so, um, so I, didn't, I mean, that's ultimately why they got the deal. Um, and now we've sort of catalyzed, I think we've catalyzed that in the space, it's a financing activity in the space, so that we, we're seeing other activity now, uh, because we were, we were made that move. It's interesting. How, how about you? Yeah, uh, so I, I think, you know, I was quite with uh, talking to others, I think it's it's interesting that uh, as soon as you're engaged in serious M and A discussions with one buyer, the other will come and talk to you. Everybody will talk to you, even if they're not interested. They just want to find out what's going on, right? What are these guys paying? Why are they doing it? And so, like, uh, it was important for us to quickly suss out, like, flesh out who's really interested and who's just here to find out what everybody else is trying to do. When the first offer comes in and they tell you you have like a week or if just a few days to figure it out, so you need to already have kind of a few contacts you can. Reach yes. out to before you have to sign. Yes, yeah, that's right. I said you don't have like weeks, maybe not even days to figure this out. You might have, you know, like one or two days to quickly figure out if somebody else is interested. Uh, and, and now the other thing for us was 
uh, we probably uh, did not really understand the motivations of the buyers enough at the time. It's something that if we had to go back and do again, we would really dig a lot deeper into that. Uh, it was a surprise to us when, we, after we were acquired by Activision, we went in there, the whole time they were talking about, oh, we love your game, we love your team, et cetera, et cetera. We got in there and we figured out that the, the CFO told us that, yeah, you know, we actually had a $50 million shortfall you know, against our forecast to, to the street. And we were running around looking for any company that had 50 million revenues. <laughs> and you were one of the few independents around that had that. And so we were filling a gap, right? And I never thought, like, oh, nobody ever brought that up in discussions that that was actually a motivation. It was said, uh, I think, by, uh, by Will, I think, from the pre session, um, from Becker's perspective, like, check, check the earning calls. Or oh, was it in the context? No, no, no. Anyway, so check the earning calls. So basically, company, that's where the company lays out their strategy. And then you can also hear where they're coming short, what kind of things they're looking for. And uh, yeah, it's probably not like a go-to place for early stage or even a growth stage companies to check the early calls of uh, potential public companies or potential buyers. And, and so that, that was sort of made them a more motivated buyer than perhaps the other people that were engaged in discussion. And had we sort of paid more attention to what their earnings calls were, we might have been able to sort of understand that uh, sort of that, besides the, the strategic motivation, some of the financial motivation. So just by improving the bottom line, they, they, they probably also had some kind of loss prior effect on the stock price and that everything would be better for them. Yeah. But, and then I guess it's hard to assess all the potential motivations. The best thing you do is just build a great business or build, build a product that finds strong product market fit, and then you'll have lots of options. Um, so, you know, the, the, the fact that you had a product that was taken off, that's ultimately what led to to get bought. Um, it's good though to have, to start conversations early in the process. And, you know, what ultimately led to our deal, uh, we, we first started talking to Uber about May of last year. Uh, by, so they reached out to you? Uh, so yeah, actually somebody that's on the Uber policy team is friends with somebody on our team. I've known him for many years as well. Uh, but then he made the connection to the product team that started to explore bikes. And so it started with like one one like ride meet and greet last spring. By July we had a term sheet to do the partnership and we started the actual software product integration. Uh, by January we were finished with the product integration. Uh, we went live with it and had a, a signed contract. I will say that the terms, the terms in that partnership agreement were fairly aggressive, and on, in terms of like just the general business terms, they were uh, not necessarily something I was excited to sign. Um, but it did open up that possibility, uh, and, and you know, did so kind of knowing it would open up that possibility. Um, so finding it, it was a way to get to work together, get to know each other, and show that you can actually get things done. Yeah, we executed it, opened up those doors. So to the extent.